Hi everyone. So in the previous video we talked about calculations of uh, heat under constant volume which of course is our QV um, and that's done using a bomb calorimeter. So in this video we're gonna, uh, I'm going to talk about how to calculate Q that's measured under constant pressure. So in a constant pressure situation the tool or the instrument you're going to use is something referred to as a coffee cup calorimeter. Okay? And uh, the reason it's called that is because it, this is a very simple experiment to do and you can make it as simple as just using one of these styrofoam cups that you find a lot in the cafeteria. Um, as long as there's uh, enough insulation, if you put two of these styrofoam cups together, basically that would insulate the heat, would uh, make sure that all the heat is just trapped in here. And so the amount of temperature increase you measure corresponds to the amount of heat that's either released or absorbed by the reaction that's placed inside this coffee cup. Okay, so you, you're going to put your reaction here. Let's say you have an acid, you add a base to it, there's a reaction, acid-base reaction, and the temperature change that you measure would correspond to the heat that accompanies that acid-base reaction. Okay, whether it's an absorption or um, release, it really depends on the um, uh, it, it depends on the reaction itself. Now, uh, as I said, this is a very easy type of uh, experiment to do. So, uh, for the majority of cases of the types of reaction that we've encountered, you can use this type of tool to measure the heat that's released by that reaction or, or absorbed. So, you can do this for acid-base reaction, redox reaction, precipitation reaction, uh, complex ion formation. If you remember, we did a lab on this uh, for making a, a something that's colorful from a transition metal and a ligand. Dissolution reaction, if you just dissolve a solid in water, uh, you can measure the amount of heat that that uh, process requires uh, and so on. So all of these is um, uh, very easily done in a coffee cup calorimeter. So by far, you're going to see most of reactions being measured using this type of instrument as opposed to the bomb calorimeter which is a, a little bit more special and it's usually a little bit more reserved for uh, combustion reactions where you have bigger changes in volume. Okay, so then remember that if we were to measure uh, the instrument, use, uh, we were to measure the heat under constant pressure the quantity that you obtain out of me that measurement is something called the enthalpy change, right? It's called delta H. Okay, so this Q sub P that you measure now, it's called delta H. Now, the question is, what is the meaning of delta H? What uh, exactly is delta H? Well, we did a derivation a couple of uh, videos ago where we said um, delta H is equal to delta E minus W and then so as a result if you express the W in terms of negative P external times delta V then delta H is basically equal to delta E plus P external delta V. So the question we want to ask ourselves is um, how useful is this value delta H because remember what I said be before is that what we want is not this delta H, we want delta E. We want the inter internal energy change that accompanies a reaction because that tells us about the molecular structure of the uh, uh, reactants and products. So if you go uh, and look at the value of delta H itself, the question then is does it represent changes in molecular structure as delta E does? Okay, And the answer is yes. And the reason it turns out is the following because for most reactions, right, the difference between delta H and delta E is really just this W term right here, okay? So if you think about it, if this W term is really small compared to the delta E, then basically for all intents and purposes, delta H is equal to delta E, right? So mathematically, if you think this number is very small relative to that, then we can ignore it, it's negligible, so delta H is pretty much equal to delta E. So in what situations would W be a small number? Well, in order to think about that, you have to think about what makes up W. W comes from expansion work, and expansion work depends on two things. It depends on pressure, and it depends on delta V. Okay. Assuming you're carrying out the reaction at you know uh, con you know the the uh, type of pressure that we have, you generally about one atmosphere or so, then really you're looking at delta V as your primary uh, con contributor of work. Okay, So if there's a change in volume, uh, 
uh, is there a big change in volume, then the work component is going to be significant. If there's a small change in volume, then the work component is going to be insignificant or is going to be negligible. Okay. Now, if you look at the uh, types of reactions we uh, encounter a lot of times, well, if you think about it, if we only have reactions without gases, okay, so for example, reactions like precipitation reaction where we have, you know, solutions mixed together producing a solid and some more solutions, really in those types of reactions, the delta V is pretty much zero, right, if you think about it, because what you know what makes up the volume there's the you have changes in solid and liquid volumes but those changes are very small relatively speaking so they're not going to make a huge contribution to work if they're not going to make huge contribution to work that means your delta h will be pretty much equal to delta e so in other words even though the quantity you measure itself is not delta e uh, it turns out that that quantity is a very close approximation of what delta E will be, okay? Just because of the fact that the type of reactions that we encounter don't really involve large changes in volume, okay? So that's the first kind of point to keep in mind, that if you're dealing with things like solid, liquid, and aqueous solutions, your delta V is really zero, and as a result, your delta H is pretty much your delta E, okay? Secondly, now, Let's talk about reactions involving gases because this is when you have big changes in volume, right? Because obviously gas expand and gas compress by huge amounts. So then we have to worry about, well, how much of that is going to uh, factor into the work value, okay? Well, if we're talking about gases, work is equal to negative P delta V. But remember, we have the ideal gas equation, which is PV equals NRT. So we can rewrite this P delta V as... NRT, but in this case, remember the delta V, the change in volume, is really uh, caused by the change in the number of mol moles of gas, number of particles of gas. If you have more gas, then you get an expansion. If you have fewer gas, then you get a compression, right? So you can write this as negative RT times delta N, delta N in this case being the change in the number of moles of gas going from reactants to products. In other words, what this is is just how many moles of uh, gas products you have minus how many moles of gas reactants you have. Okay, so you want to write that down in your notes because that's uh, basically what delta N is. Now, so if you think about it then, uh, there are three different situations, okay? Assuming you have exactly the same number of moles of gas before and after the reaction, right? Your delta N, therefore, is zero. If your delta N is zero, that means this whole quantity is zero, which means your work is zero. If your work is zero, that means your delta H is equal to your delta E, okay? So that's one situation. Even if you have gases, if they happen to exactly equal each other in terms of number of moles, then you have uh, delta H equals delta E. If... If, on the other hand, you have your delta N less than zero, and so what that means is you uh, start with more gas in the reactant and then you produce fewer gas in the product, right? Um, in that case, then, what you have, of course, is uh, delta N being a negative number. If delta N is a negative number, if you, we put it all together into the uh, equation originally here, you know, that means that this whole thing here... Um, becomes a negative number. If that's a negative number, then that means your delta H is less than your delta E, right? So that's the conclusion that's given here. And vice versa, if your delta N is bigger than zero, which means you produce more gas in your product than you have in your reactant, then, then your delta H would be positive, okay? I mean, I mean, your delta H will be greater than delta E, not positive, greater than delta E. Okay, so that's those are the three different situations that you have um, when you dealing with gases so what I wanna before you know uh, I'm gonna do a couple examples in the next video but what I wanna conclude out of this is the following that remember what I said at the beginning of this video is that most of the time for a huge majority of the reactions you encounter the value that you're going to find in you know reference tables and so forth would be values of Delta H uh, people don't usually uh, tabulate values of delta E. There are some uh, values of delta E that are tabulated, but most of the time when you look at tables, as you'll see later on, what you'll see is value of delta H, which is change in enthalpy.
So then uh, the reason for that is because it's so easy to measure in comparison to delta E uh, measurement under constant volume that we just tend to measure this type of uh, uh, heat change. Okay. Now, the reason, of course, that I spend so much time talking about this here is because it turns out that the delta H that you measure is in most cases similar to delta E or if not exactly equal. Okay, so as a result, you only have to worry in certain conditions when delta H is not equal to delta E, only when there's uh, gases involved and only if there's different numbers of moles of gases before and after the reaction. So that's really kind of when we have to worry about, you know, thinking about maybe delta E is not exactly the same as the delta H value. Okay, so in the next video, I'll do a couple examples on this and hopefully that will clear things up on how to calculate delta H.